Welcome to Recap, QQ here, accompanied by producer Johnny D. Let's jump right into the latest shenanigans in the gaming press. So what exactly qualifies as news these days? Well, I'm going to do a post-mortem on a moment in lousy games journalism that happened recently. This is an epic tale in irresponsible sourcing. Jed Wicketer of Destructoid, Kevin McMinn of Nintendo News, Ben Skipper of International Business Times, and Dan Van Winkle of The Mary Sue all published articles on the gay conversion therapy that takes place in the yet-to-be-formally-translated Fire Emblem Fates. The articles state that a lesbian character in the game is non-consensually drugged in order to make them fall in love with the male protagonist. The articles link to a pastebin which contains a fan translation of the dialogue, which, well, I read the translation in question, and... If one reads it in a certain light where the planets are aligned just so and you've not had your coffee this morning and it could possibly be construed in some shape or form to perhaps resemble something like what these articles attempt to describe. So how did all four of these publications pull the same narrative out of their collective asses about gay conversion therapy with non-consensual drugging? I mean, I've seen enough discussion and back and forth about this translation to see that it's not exactly that decisive, and the chances of four publications all coming to exactly the same conclusion on the same day are slim at best. So are you ready to go down the source rabbit hole? First, there was a fan translation posted on 4chan, and then posted on the Serene's Forest forums with commentary, which was joked about on Twitter and analyzed in a Tumblr fashion on an actual Tumblr blog. So the source chain goes, the games journalist got their narrative from Tumblr and Twitter, which in turn cited a fan site and 4chan. Great research, guys. Turns out that while the character is not written fantastically, it's not so simple as being just gay conversion therapy. The drug was to help cure fainting spells that a character would experience when they're around cute women, and they did it in a roundabout, hand-wavy way of using magic to reverse that character's gender perceptions. As for it being non-consensual, the character asked for any remedy possible to be administered to her, and this character appears to have been bisexual and not a lesbian in the first place. In other words, confusing? Sure. Badly written? Eh, maybe. Gay conversion therapy? Eh, heck no. All of these games journalists had access to the same fan translation of the dialogue that everyone else has, but they decided to all run with the same narrative, the one from the fan forum, from Twitter, and from Tumblr, instead of drawing their own conclusions. Again, another case of games journalists latching on to a questionable narrative and all writing the same article about it at the same time. Hmm, where have I heard that before? You know, I keep wondering if there's a Game Journal Pros 2.0 out there somewhere, or if all these journalists just group think together so hard that these things happen naturally. Thankfully, Games Nosh, Attack on Gaming, Niche Gamer, and Game Ranks wrote articles clearing up the misconceptions, and I'll link them in the description, with an optional archive link for Game Ranks, so you can decide for yourself on that one. <laughs> That wasn't the only problem found in games journalism in the last two weeks. I'll have to go through these somewhat quickly because there's so damn many of them. On Saturday, June 20th, Boogie Pop Robin made the discovery that Sam Beddoes was paying Indie Haven on Patreon. Laura Kate of Indie Haven went on to cover Sam Beddoes and the game studio that he's associated with, Freak Zone Games, in an article and a podcast without any disclosure. Tuesday, June 23rd, Boogie Pop Robin discovered that the same Laura Kate was paying Gemma Thompson on Patreon, and Gemma Thompson was in turn paying Indie Haven on Patreon. These financial relationships were left undisclosed in a podcast that Laura Kate did in association with Indie Haven on Gemma Thompson and her game Mimic. And Laura also failed to disclose them in a Destructoid article that she wrote, where Laura wrote about an event that Gemma was one of the founders of. Saturday, June 27th. Boogie Pop Robin finds that back in 2009, Critical Distance wrote two articles that shilled out the least professional-looking gaming blog that I've ever seen, Hard Casual. Evidence exists that at the time, there may have been a financial relationship between Critical Distance, Hard Casual, and the writer for Hard Casual, Chris Plant. Monday, June 29th, Boogie Pop Robin finds that J.V. Gwaltney, and I hope I'm pronouncing that right, when writing for Paste Magazine, had given a 9.0 rating to the game Sunset. Everyone's favorite gamer-hating games journalist, master of having no ethical standards whatsoever, Leigh Alexander, was paying that writer on Patreon, and was also acting as a consultant for the game Sunset at the same time. 
Wednesday, July 1st, PyFrag on Reddit noticed that a Destructoid article contained tons of Amazon affiliate links without any disclosure, directly in violation of the FTC rules regarding affiliate links. Once they were called out, a half-hearted disclosure was added to the article. Thursday, July 2nd, Holiday Howlet made the discovery that Patrick Klepek wrote an article on the Arkham Knight PC port that laid the blame for the failure of that port squarely at the feet of the publisher, WB. What Patrick did not disclose is that he's friends with Dave Lang, the CEO of Iron Galaxy, which was one of the dev teams that worked on the port. So there we go, yet more proof that Gamergate is just a giant conspiracy theory and that there's no ethical problems in gaming. Oh, wait. Ah, SPJ Airplay, a testament to how little sense this whole thing makes to outsiders. For those new to the topic, Airplay is an event that the Society of Professional Journalists is having to let those involved with the Gamergate events air their concerns. Koretsky is the name of the person holding this event. Koretsky made another update on the SPJ Airplay website where he announces, to the surprise of nobody involved in the Gamergate events, that nobody that he considers to be anti-Gamergate is going to show up, at least the ones that he's contacted so far. Arthur Chu even blocked him on Twitter. He went on to give a bizarre rant that I can only think to summarize as him saying that a harassment apology, or anything that resembles it even slightly, will not be allowed at airplay. The issue is that he seems to use a very broad definition of what makes someone a harassment apologist, like presenting any evidence that goes against the harassment narrative, he didn't like that. So opinion time. Here's my personal problem with Koretsky's attitude. He divides people involved in the Gamergate event, who he still calls Gamergators, into two groups. The good Gamergators who are willing to denounce harassment on demand, and the bad Gamergators who won't do that. This is an absurd dichotomy, of course. I mean, most of us won't denounce things that we didn't participate in and have nothing to do with. Who have I harassed? Anyone? Nope. Well, then sorry. I mean, harassment is terrible, but why do I even need to denounce it? Who supports harassment? I mean, the default position for people in general is to dislike harassment. Heck, if someone is specifically advocating for harassment, those are the ones you should be asking to denounce it. The people in the gaming industry who publicly advocate in favor of doxing, for example. Like this guy. You have every right to say it, and I have every right to call you a fucking asshole and try to find your address yes. and put it out there! I don't need to denounce doxing and harassment because I've never advocated in favor of either of those things. And the default position that a rational mind should take is that disliking harassment is the natural thing to do. However, it seems like there's some games journalists like Sessler here who don't have such clean hands. Anyway, Koretsky tried to calm us all down with a six-hour stream, which I'm going to attempt to summarize by saying that Koretsky is just the debate organizer, and we don't have to convince him of anything in advance in order for the debate to be fair. Fair enough, I guess, but then the issue becomes that these airplay updates aren't putting that message across very well. I'll stick to my theory that Koretsky is poking us and provoking a reaction on purpose. I don't know why, but I wouldn't be surprised if there's a big Gonzo-style piece written once all this is concluded that covers what Koretsky did and what it was like to be the creator of Airplay. And that's all I have time to cover this recap. A tangential thing that happened was there was another escalation in the Reddit revolt, with a large percent of subreddits, and even default ones, going private for a while in protest of some important Reddit staff being fired, which caused some long-standing concerns about poor communication between volunteer moderators and incompetent staff administrators to boil over. But that's more Reddit drama than Gamergate drama, so you'll have to read up on that yourself. I'll put a link to a Breitbart article in the description. Anyway, we'll see you again next time. Thanks so much for your support and comments. We couldn't do this without you guys. Ciao!